good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome uh, this uh, this talk is uh, part of an outreach campaign by uh, central zoo authority uh, which is uh, titled conservation to coexistence the people connect this is uh, being organized as part of the azadi ka amrut mahotsav celebrations to commemorate uh, 25 years of indian independence uh, as part of this campaign uh, 75 species and 75 zoos have been selected as uh, as a focus to spread conservation awareness about species conservation and ex situ conservation in general so this is the 68th week of the celebration uh, which is uh, part of this ongoing uh, campaign and the species in focus is uh, the indian grey hornbill and the zoo in focus is uh, marvel palace zoo in kolkata Today we have two speakers, Dr. Raju Kasambe uh, from BNHS and uh, Dr. Tapendra Malik from uh, Marbel Palace Zoo, Kolkata. The first talk uh, will be by uh, Dr. Raju Kasambe on uh, the species in focus, that is the Indian grey hornbill. Uh, just a brief introduction about uh, Dr. Raju Kasambe. Dr. Raju is uh, the Assistant Director Education at uh, BNHS and uh, oversees act activities at, and also oversees activities at the BNHS uh, Conservation Education Center in Mumbai. Uh, he has co-authored a book uh, on uh, important bird and biodiversity areas in India and also he has co-authored an e-book uh, uh, about 100 common birds in India which is available in uh, 10 regional languages that is uh, downloadable for free. Uh, his talk uh, today will highlight uh, the ecology of the Indian grey hornbill Uh, and with special insights on the breeding ecology of the species over to you sir thank you very much for inviting me for this talk and i'll just start uh, share my presentation now Sorry. is that visible Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. Thanks to CJD for this uh, starting this initiative of uh, 75 zoos and 75 species in India, and I am happy to present uh, give a small presentation on breeding behavior of Indian grey hornbill. This is basically about uh, one species and my uh, my insights which I got through the PhD work, uh, my doctoral work which I did in uh, uh, in Maharashtra in Nagpur city. And uh, also, this was associated with the uh, Nagpur Zoo or Maharashtra Zoo in Nagpur, uh, where I did most of the research work. So this is the Indian grey hornbill. Uh, on these uh, two corners, you can see. So these are male Indian grey hornbills, and you can see a, a, an insect across the world uh, in its beak. So uh, starting about how to differentiate. So the male and female look very different. you can see the uh, this is the horn that's why the bird is known as hornbill and uh, because of the horn which the hornbills have hornbills are also known as the rhinoceros among the birds so the male has a bigger and pointed uh, horn also known as cask and uh, the skin around the eye is black and you can see the difference eye color iris difference is also a prominent whereas the female has pinkish uh, skin around the eye and this is one bird which has got eyelashes you can see the eyelashes here so it's it's different from many other birds and not all birds do have eyelashes so this is the sexual dimorphism so the male the female and this is the juvenile or just fledgling fledgling means the bird which just came out from the nest so the the skin color around the eye for the juvenile is a cream color or creamish that's how it is different and it, it lacks the horn or the cask is absent in the juveniles so it grows in one year so indian grey hornbill as a, this is the latest description of indian grey hornbill as per e bird data provided by 15000 bird watchers and you can see it's not there in the high altitude himalayas kashmir and ladakh and in uh, extreme northeast india it's not there and in western ghats it's not there where the similar looking species that is the malabar grey hornbill is found so it avoids the area where it is found and rest of the india you can see and uh, very extreme dry areas it avoids that is gujarat and rajasthan whereas it's there everywhere in most of the peninsular india so uh, when i started work i had a uh, few questions in my mind about uh, hornbill and i wanted to understand uh, like what is the breeding behavior what do they eat during breeding 
how do they raise the babies? So all those questions were there, and I I had like uh, not not many equipments with me, so I had just a, a pair of binoculars, a Sony Handycam camera. This is a video camera, and a Canon uh, digital camera with uh, 300 mm uh, tele lens. Uh, the other options were collecting indirect evidence, like collecting the excreta of the birds from the from under the nest. So that is also known as midden. So midden means besides excreta, if there is something else also lying under the nest, you collect. And then collect the data about floating phenology. That means when I am moving around in the habitat, like the Nagpur Zoo, the Marasbag Zoo, I am collecting data on which which trees are having fruits. And uh, and uh, they, uh, I conducted this study in a uh, city, that's the Nar Nagpur city, which has got a good amount of greenery. And the big zoo is in the center of the city. So that is one more important thing. So this is how, this is a big, huge Arjuna tree, and this was based, uh, this was located in the uh, enclosure of the spotted deers in the Marasbag Zoo. You can see the uh, cage. And we put a net. This is a 10 by 10, 10 feet by 10 feet. Uh, net which we have put under exactly under the nest of the hornbill to collect whatever is falling from the hornbill nest. So I had selected like one nest as a focal nest on which I'll concentrate my most of, uh, observations. And we used collect uh, a method known as time budgeting. That is for, uh, for an hour I will take observation and then that hour can be divided into how many, uh, how the hornbill use the time. So that I, I need to take observations for every minute and then do the analysis of the excreta and the mid which is found under the nest. So that's how I do the study. And of course, I analyze the, uh, watch the videos and uh, watch the videos and find out what the hornbill was feeding to the female. Yeah. So this is how, this is the nest. You can see the, at the top end of this tree, there is a small hole. And we tried to put a video camera. And there, at that time, we, it was a webcam and a small TV set I purchased, which runs on a battery. And we tried. This was just an experiment. So we did not continue it. But now there, there are better quality webcams available, which can be just connected directly to a hard disk and a computer. So this is a nesting tree. And interestingly, this tree was just in front of the house of the Principal Chief Conservator of the Forest, PCCF of Maharashtra State. And uh, so, so you can see that it, it was here and the, the gates are there, two gates, and this is a uh, road with a very good amount of traffic. And uh, this is one nest in Samanya Saman tree. Another, uh, then uh, I, I just tried to show you two more nests. Uh, so one, one more Samanya Saman tree and then Albizia tree, this one. You can see the tray nest in the middle of the, uh, the trunk, main trunk. And in this trees, it's on the side branches. The other nest was here in the canopy. One more nest was uh, in the Marasbag Zoo. This is the children's park or uh, children's uh, playing area. And there was one Alstonia scholarly tree. And the nest was here. And the entire public, the kids were playing. There was a lot of noise and the there was nesting here. So it's, it, was, it was very interesting to observe this nest. So the hornbill starts its courtship at least three hours, uh, three months before actual, uh, actually the female seals herself inside the nest cavity. As you know, or you might have heard, the hornbills, female seals herself in the tree cavity and the nest in tree cavities. But there are other birds which also need a nest or breed in tree cavities like uh, parrots or parakeets and common minas and macro robins and owls and owlets. But they don't seal the nest cavity. The nest cavity is open. but Hornbill nest, the female seals the nest cavity. That's very interesting. And she stays inside for a long duration. So the courtship starts to involve searching and visiting potential nest cavities. And uh, the male keeps offering the female with fruits. There are many species of birds with uh, this, this happens, uh, male feeding the female. And generally, the fruits which are fed are like ficus fruits, uh, figs, and uh, some animal uh, food like. Uh, garden lizards. The hornbill also offers inedible objects like the mud pellets and uh, sorry, and this is uh, also offer inedible objects like mud pellets and pieces of bark. And I was like very much intrigued and interested in why the hornbill is feeding, uh, is providing the female 
giving the female pieces of bark and the female will break those pieces of bark and of course it's not edible so she won't eat it she will just break the piece of bark and just throw it so the mating happened near the nest after courtship feeding so that's how the courtship continued i'll show you some photographs to make it interesting there was also some playing behavior and that uh, playing behavior is known as bill grappling uh, if you can see me the the, the two male and female hornbills will hold each other's beak like this and pull each other also this there is something known as pull, tail pulling and passing the food from one to another like the male will give the food to the female female will return to the male and it, this goes on without swallowing or without eating the female stops foraging as the day of incarceration so incarceration means the, the female seals herself that's the day uh, the entire um, uh, duration when she is inside it stops feeding and the male feeds most of the uh, diet to her so she spends most of her time in preening and basking in sunlight so this is the male inspecting the uh, now you can see the uh, this is the this is the male on the top and the female is with the pink skin so the male brought the female to this nest cavity and uh, first the male inspects and then the female inspects the nest cavity so this is another nest cavity you can see this is the female and this is the male the male is showing the female that this is a potential nest and we can do the nesting here so these are two more nests you can in which you can see the male is having food in its beak here and in here the female with the ivory colored beak is she has accepted the food so these are two different nests and uh, two different photographs then the bill grappling and uh, feeding that's so you can see the bill grappling is happening here and here the male offered the female with a piece of thing from the banyan tree also the male offered uh, beetles and shells fast nails you can see so this is courtship and you can see uh, when i when i uh, click on the next photograph you will see some movement happening like this and like this they do so these are known as some symmetrical movements like you can see it's a dance but this goes on and also they move the tail up and down so that, that also is symmetrical both male and female will do that so so when the time of incarceration that is the ceiling female seals herself when the time comes the male collects mud pellets from the ground wherever there is a muddy patch or some river or some stream and it it's some it collects sticky mud and supplies to the female not only that the female will also collect you can see this is the female and she has got a mud pellet in her beak here and the male is observing inspecting the nest if there is some rubbish lying inside the nest cavity for example the common mynas nest in this cavity so the hornbill will use the nest cavity so the male, male throws out the whatever material the common mina has collected inside the cavity you can see the female here with the mud pellet she is trying to put inside so the male with the mud pellet here the male here and the female is sitting here and now here in the right picture you can see the male is giving the mud pellet but the, the nest slit this the slit is already sealed and you can see a vertical slit there so that is how this is the vertical seal lid you can see so the female is already sealed inside the male is still providing some mud to the female so now this is the female is inside the nest you can see her beak here and this is the seal slit here so when she seals herself and don't come out generally what happens is in the initial phase she goes inside the cavity gets the mud from the male and tries and starts sealing the uh, nest cavity from inside by using her beak slowly slowly the cavity sealing work is complete and one day comes when the female cannot really come out from this small slit so for calculation purpose that how many days she stays stays inside we count this as day one so this is in uh, if you come to mumbai this is in the chatrapati uh, shivaji maharaj vastu sangrahalaya or museum there is a nest and two uh, specimens of the great hornbill uh, showing the nest so this is how the nest happens this is the tree cavity and this is how the male will perch and provide food and all the groceries which the female needs uh, it will provide through this nest slit so this is a uh, actual uh, male male great hornbill and the female and you can see a chick also inside the nest so the breeding cycle of indian grey hornbill is like this so when the female seals herself a nearly one month the female is there inside the nest with the eggs so she is incubating around one month what happens the egg shell she throws out the egg shell 
So when the when I get the exhale down on the net which we have installed under the nest, I know the good news that their babies are there. So then the babies are there, and uh, the female remains with the babies for up to 65 to 70 days. Okay. After that, the female comes out, and only the chicks will remain. So the chicks will remain in the nest for another 30 to 35 days. So the total will be one month, one more month, and one more month. So it will be around three months total cycle and when the chicks as well as female are out. So you can see the male alone takes care of the female as well as the chicks when they are all sealed inside. So this is a male providing a garden lizard when she is incarcerated and this is the nest which we have seen where I have tried to put the jet cam. So this is the material thrown out from the nest cavity by the female and which we collected under the nest. So from this uh, material, we, we get to know a lot of things. One is the female is molting inside. So she throws out all her primaries and secondaries as well as her tail feathers or rectrices. So from that, we know that she is molting. And if if you break the nest and put the female, uh, take the female out, she won't be able to fly. And she also, uh, the male also provides species of bark which she throws out. And I also collected this. And eggshells, of course, tell you that the babies are there. So you can see the male feeding the female and male has brought a feed here and here also. So the male is taking care of the females when for the 65 to 70 days. So after 65 to 70 days, the female breaks the wall with her beak and you can hear the banging sound. She comes out like this and, uh, and then she flies out. Then what happens? So the female also now starts helping the male. Also, she has brought a garden lizard for the babies or the chicks, which are there in the nest. And the male also supplies the food. So female, female will also try to help. But the female, she has just grown new feathers because she had molted the primary, secondary, and tail feathers. So she is not able to really help the male the way the male brings the food. So I tried to understand and I observed the nest for 14 hours, that morning 5 a.m. to evening 7 p.m and found that the male was providing maximum food and this is the chair table in which you can observe how the male has taken the big share and the lion's share in, su in supplying the uh, groceries and food to the chicks. So what are the keystone species? So when I calculated the amount of food which is supplied to the nest, I found that the people pigs, that is ficus religiosa, are maximum, that is 50, more than 51% and banyan pigs are around 22%. So you, you can just imagine the total becomes 73%. So out of the entire diet, these two trees are providing 73% of the diet. That means these two trees are very, very important for the survival of farm bills. And wherever you go in the world, fruit bearing trees, especially the pigs, will be very important for the survival and uh, for the survival and conservation of farm bills. That's why we these trees, uh, pig trees are considered very important in the Indian uh, culture also, and we don't cut those trees, especially in Vidarbha. The Indians, the Hindus will never cut people trees, banyan trees, and gular, that is the ficus racimosa trees. These three trees are, are considered as Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh, or the abode of these three deities. There are other fruits which the hornbills provide, that is the uh, chichbilai, or the jangli jalebi, kirni, or these are the scientific names, and grasshoppers, carpenter bees, and garden lizards. So, this is the people tree things. These are ficus uh, banyan pigs. These are cluster fig or ugular pigs, and these are kirni tree pigs. So, or Manilka exandra, Lokandi or Ixora, bear. Bear also is a small part. Then uh, Daikam, then uh, neem, of course, Ajadiracta indica. So, this is also very important. They provide a lot of uh, neem fruits. Then fish bilai or jangli jalebi, palm fruits, shaitu, and bakul or mimosox elingi. The hornbill also was seen feeding on the uh, poisonous fruits of yellow oleander, or that's the Asia nerifolia. You can see these fruits. These fruits are not eaten by many species, but I have seen quails, Asian quails, feeding on the poisonous fruits of yellow oleander. Then uh, garden lizards, then shells. This is the African giant snail, carpenter bees, and grasshoppers. So these also form the non vegetarian diet. Very interesting thing is they feed on non-vegetarian diet during the breeding season. But as soon as the breeding season is over, they don't eat much of non-vegetarian food. They go back to the 
fruit eating habits that's why the worm bees are known as fruit eating birds or frugivorous birds so they also eat lot of leaf material and uh, the important the three important uh, uh, leaf material or matter which i have registered is one is the allantis excelsa or the mar which is a medicinal plant if you if you crush these leaves and uh, drink a small amount of the uh, extract or the juice made from the leaves it will kill the worms in your belly you don't need to eat any uh, allopathic medicines it is such a simple medicine and uh, this is the medicine i took as a kid the chaitut leaves the eat and papaya leaves the eat so this the, all these leaves have got medicinal properties and i'm, I'm sure the harm will understand that they are important for to keep their tummy in good condition and uh, they also eat lot of fruits and this is papaya fruit and uh, supplying wheat chapati now these are new records actually so in indore my ajay gadikar has found that the harm bees also are eating wheat chapati so the uh, incarceration lasts for 65 to 70 days and the first chick comes out up around 93 to 98 days so this is this is the first this is when the baby chick actually came just i took this photograph and it loves sunlight because it has never seen sunlight in its life so that first first day it spends it, uh, just enjoying the sunlight and the food supplied by the parents this is this was one chick which was rescued in Nagpur and brought to my house so for three days they, i i i took the baby out where it was found and the hornbill parents came and took the baby with them and it was reunited so this is the breeding success i found that only one uh, only one chick survived in in 16 nesting attempts only six uh, 15 chicks could survive so my question is when the hornbills stay inside the female is sealed inside how does she throw the excreta out so uh, the particularly whole nesting birds like the beaters and kingfishers the nests are very dirty if you go near a beater nest you will feel you can you can smell that ammonia might be you will faint with that bad odor odor so sunbirds and robins excreta is passed in capsule known as fecal sac whereas in uh, uh, birds like eagles the ex excreta is squirted with physical force but in uh, birds like crows, the excreta is eaten by parents, or the adult birds. But in many birds, the even, nest, even the open nests are dirty, like the rock pigeons and vultures. So how the hornbill is throwing the excreta out? Because he is sealed inside, and a small slit is there. He has to throw in a like it's like a half a centimeter or one centimeter uh, wide slit. And how does he throw it? So considering the amount of figs which are supplied to the nesting mates and figs have very high water content that's that's the reason why hornbills never drink water and the nest inmates nest nest inmates will dry die and drone if the excreta is not thrown out so so the nest can nest is not cleaned all the it can attract the ants then i found that the female squirts the excreta from the nest slit because i put the video camera there and i observed continuously the videos so she turns around aims at the slit perfectly uh, like you aim a gun and she squirts the excreta with physical force and the male cleans the excreta lying at the nest entrance and study so then i studied the, the excreta and the midden which was lying under underside and uh, uh, tried to understand how they manage so uh, the babies of hornbills are blind okay so the babies of hornbills are blind so they cannot see the ex excreta their nest slit and it is impossible for them that they will uh, aim at that and uh, spot the excreta from the particular sleeve. So there was some other mechanism. So when I was studying the midden, I found that it contained eggshells, bark pieces, fruits, molded feathers, nail shells, and other debris. So the other debris included these bark pieces, and I remembered that the, when the courtship was happening, the male was offering the female bark pieces, and the bark pieces she was crushing and throwing. But when the nesting was happening, the male was still supplying the bark pieces, whereas the female never eat the bark pieces. So what she was doing? So simple. What she was doing? So these are the male giving bark pieces to the female. So she was keeping the bark pieces on the floor of the nest on which the chicks were chicks do defecate. So the chicks defecate on the bark pieces and she throws the excreta. She throws the bark pieces out and you can see the excreta stuck on this. So that's why the um, female was, was breaking the bark pieces because she wanted to check whether the bark pieces are dry and crunchy and will absorb maximum moisture 
and water from the excreta and the, those uh, excreta, these bark pieces can be thrown out with the excreta stuck on the surface. There are two things in physics known as uh, adsorption and absorption. So those bark pieces will have the best property to adsorb, that is speaking, and absorb, that is absorbing the moisture. That's how the nest remains clean and the arm sticks don't drone inside the nest cavity. So this is the explanation I found and I gave a presentation and a research paper was written on this. So that is the nest sanitation. So they use the bark pieces like you see diapers here or this toilet papers you can see. So that's a very interesting phenomena seen in Indian gray hornbills. So why hornbills breed in hot summer? That was one more question in my mind and I found that all the trees on which the hornbills were feeding, they have fruits in summer. All the feed trees have fruits in summer in central India, whereas at the same time, the temperature is very high. Uh, in Nagpur, you can see the temperature sometimes reaches 45 degrees, and I, I came to know that it also goes to 46, 47 degrees. This the same thing will happen in Indore and in, uh, in Bangalore, I'm sure in, uh, in many other cities. And the hornbills are known to breed in cities like Delhi and Chandigarh and Pune, and Nagpur, Indore, uh, Raipur and Bangalore, all those big cities in uh, so this is the only hornbill which which enjoys the uh, urban habitat also all other hornbill species are found in the forest of course indian gray hornbills are also found in the forest but they also are found in the urban habitat so this is about all about my presentation and i thank uh, central zoo authority again for inviting me uh, for delivering this talk what do you sir uh, thank you so much sir uh, that was quite comprehensive uh, uh, information about the species and quite in insightful as well. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, so we now uh, move to the next, uh, uh, which is uh, Dr. Uh, Tapendra Malik, who is the uh, officer in charge of Marble Palace Zoo. Uh, he will uh, give an overview about the uh, zoo and uh, and the efforts made by the zoo uh, for exit to conservation. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Tapendro. Uh, there seems to be a bit of a technical uh, snag. Uh, we'll just be back. Uh, Dr. Tapendro, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, yes. Uh, over to you, sir. Uh, you can start with your talk now. But I, I can't see. Uh, do you see me in video? Uh, the video doesn't seem to work. The video doesn't seem to work yet. Just a minute. Sure. Uh, so, yeah. Please continue, sir. Okay. 
Shall I start? Yes, sir, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And many thanks to Dr. Raju. Actually, it is a very vivid presentation and particularly uh, for the breeding of these uh, gray hornbills. Because though we, uh, we have kept the gray hornbills for a long time, but no breeding was, was possible for this particular species. But uh, at the same time, we have the pied hornbill, that is the Malabar pied hornbill. They have started nesting because we have put a very big trunk and they are just trying. But unfortunately, this is the last year, uh, in the last summer, but we didn't get any egg or offsprings. Anyhow, that is different. <clears throat> but the thing is that these gray hornbills, though it is dry deciduous area uh, bird, it is also well survived in West Bengal climate because one of our uh, gray hornbill it has laid away from the cage about five years back, but still it is there in the garden and sometimes comes to the cages and it is quite quite healthy and. As Dr. Raju told just before, that they are the surviving over the banyan tree fruit and also the people fruit. And both the plants are there in our zoo. So I have seen and I give to the cages also these type of fruits. And I provide some, uh, but they are eating and it is a very good, that is a devdar fruit. Devdar fruit, and uh, they eat it uh, quite happily. So apart from this uh, gray hornbills, I shift to, to our zoo, because for the gray hornbills, what Dr. Raju has told, nothing to describe more about the species and the this and the, uh, this type of i mean the breeding and other things and they are they are uh, very playful and also they don't disturb and if sometimes it was some other birds also in the same enclosure it is a big enclosure two enclosures are there two pairs are there they don't fight each other. And they are in pairs at there. So there is no question of fighting. And uh, now I'm shift, I'm shifting towards the zoo specimens, other specimens and our zoo. Particularly, this is the oldest zoo in India, but I have recorded or it, it has already been recorded because it was uh, started for the public view from 1854. It is quite bad, uh, long back. And Raja Rajendra Mulli, he was our ancestors, and he started this uh, zoo. I can say that that time maybe some other zoo because one zoo in Kolkata, that time it is Calcutta, was there uh, from is in the Barakpur area and another in nearby. There is still, it is known as, the area is known as the Chiria Moor. There is a, mostly the Chiriyas are there, Chiria Ghar was there, and for that reason, it is still, it is known as Chiria Moor. But no zoos are there. Zoo has been abolished long back, it is 100 years back. So this is the oldest zoo. And he made this zoo not only for his own benefit, because that time the, the rich men and the zamindars and uh, the kings and other, other people, they make some aviaries and some menageries. That time they used to say menageries, not the zoo, because that was the concept. And they kept it for the pleasure only. And the people also, they come to see only for pleasure. But this type of breeding 
and conservation it didn't arise at that time because the animals birds and reptiles they were plenty abundant in, in uh, outside that is in forest and other places but he has the mind he has already thought about this zoo because that time he contacted the london zoo and he uh, from here he exported a pair of gold and nicobar pigeon it is in record because i have written one book and in that book i have uh, though it is uh, now it is on it is in bengali this is the book it is his picture i can show you and many other things like uh, <clears throat> these things uh, i am just explaining these things because that will be in the book and and they have made him the member the managing member of the london zoological society he has made the same thing with the antwerp zoo also and antwerp zoo also made him like that and the melbourne zoo of australia so he has exported many things and in paper cutting i have got that paper cutting in paper cutting it was stated that the female gaur that time they used to say bison uh, the female bison died in the ship anyhow he again replaced it and the most interesting thing is that after the sipahi mutiny though i am going a little bit away from this uh, particular zoo but this is our history of the zoo so i am just explaining this thing after the sipahi mutiny there is the 1857 the nawab of aut nawab wajid ali shah now the lucknow zoo has been named as nawab wajid ali shah zoo and he was sent to calcutta the whole team of nawab has come to calcutta here in the metia buruj region so in metia buruj he stayed there and rajendra murli the founder of marul palace zoo is friend of that time was the friend of nawab wajid ali shah rajendra murli has presented some of the birds like white peacocks and some cranes to uh, nawab wajid ali shah and nawab wajid ali shah started his zoo at metia gurus by getting those gifts and they thought that those do one in the north kolkata and another in the south that is the metia buruj kedia buruj kedipur region the both the zoos will survive unfortunately that metia buruj zoo of nawab wajid ali shah didn't survive long but rajendra murli has got his in mind that one big zoo should be there for the general people of kolkata so he first donated some money and some portion for uh, the land and he made the first building in the calcutta zoo which is now known as calcutta alipur zoo the first building was made by Raja Rajendra Murli and his son. Still, it is named as Mullik House. Last only just five six years back, it was very old. Now they have renovated, and the director of uh, Alipur Zoo, uh, Dr. Shamanto, he told me that he wants to get some old pictures of those buildings. But only I could provide only single one. Anyhow, that is. the issue that raja rajendra murli tried to just expand the zoo concept to keep the zoo to keep the zoos for the breeding because that time the demosil trains many many of them i have got that picture also 
about 60, they were roaming inside this palace garden. And that time we got, it was recorded that only few uh, of them were there for long time. Anyhow, breeding, I don't know whether they have read it or not. That is a long back story. And he has kept many other things. Previously, we had zebras and chimpanzees and other things also. And now, this zoo, this Marble Palace Zoo, it was for the public show. I mean, the people from outside, they can come and see. And it was written in his uh, will that the people will come to the zoo at free of cost because the people will should know about the animals and birds of our country and also of other countries. It was his thought, it was his motto and after that still it is continuing. Now we are under the Central Zoo Authority we have that passion, we have that uh, time, we have that uh, money, because we didn't take any money from Central Zoo Authority. We can provide money. That is the trust can provide. We have got one trust and trust can provide. Only thing is that there is a little scarcity of land because it is at the just middle of the city. So we have, uh, we don't have many other species, and we contacted Central Zoo Authority so that we can keep uh, many other birds. So the exotic birds are there also, and it is breeding like uh, blue and gold macaw and some other exotic birds like uh, the other macaws the phasins, the uh, ring phasins, silver phasins, these golden phasins, they are also breeding. And the parakeets, we have got many varieties of parakeets. And it is in very good uh, position. They are breeding also. And we have got the YOLO. Alexandrian parakeet, Yolo Alexandrian parakeet, and it is now breeding. We have got the offsprings. It is now it is increased from two to five, and many other birds. And there is a lawn, not only single lawn, some water birds also there. Water birds means those. Uh, Ducks, goose, bar headed gooses. The bar headed goose last year it uh, laid egg, but most probably that was not uh, fertilized egg. It didn't give anything. But it hatched. The first thing I have noticed in my period that has been long 15, 16 years. And we are keeping all these for the uh, show, I mean, for the public, and we are just trying to keep, and we have some other mammals also. This is not concerned now, but what will happen afterwards? Because it is very difficult to breed all these in captivity, very difficult, particularly the migratory bird. So after some time, the migratory birds uh, there will be no migratory birds in the zoo. So either we have to procure from outside and maybe from other zoos. I don't know any if any other zoos of India has breeded bar headed goose or grey lag goose or uh, like those type of uh, migratory ducks and goose. Anyhow, that is the separate issue. Not uh, this is the I have just. Tony, I have just told you about my zoo 
and the zoo has got another thing the people they come to see that is one museum in the palace the both the palace and the zoological garden it is in the same compound though it is demarcated by wallet but it is in the same so the people who come to see the zoo they go to the museum also and some people who come to see the museum they also go to the that's just like in the uh, darjeeling zoo because the mountaineering institute and the zoo, both of them side by side at the same instance. whenever the tourist uh, the people come, they can see both. We have got many paintings and other things, uh, skulls, glasses, because in general, now it is the foreigners, they are not coming because due to this pandemic. Otherwise, daily, we get at least 200 to 250 foreigners for the, uh, they come for the visit for the museum and the zoo. So it is our uh, zoo, but in brief, what I have explained and uh, uh, gray hornbills, we have only two pairs and two pairs, they didn't breathe. So I'm trying to get some, uh, I'm giving some wood trunk and the holes but this time the pirate hornbill started. I hope they will do next year. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you so much, sir, uh, for giving us a, a good overview of the activities that are being undertaken at Marble Palace Zoo and also the history of the zoo. Uh, so. Uh, so we now have uh, a few questions. Uh, there are three of them, actually. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Raju, sir, and then we will uh, uh, we will then proceed to Dr. Uh, Tapendra uh, Malik for the questions. Uh, so yeah, the first question is to Dr. Raju. Uh, Dr. Raju, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. the The first question is. Uh, uh, in in general, uh, if we take hornbills as a species, or uh, Indian grey hornbill also in specific, uh, are they uh, good candidates for ex situ conservation? I mean, is there a, what is do they serve as good candidates for ex situ conservation? Is there a, a need for actively taking up ex situ conservation measures to conserve the species? Yeah, first basically the, the the enclosure needs to be bigger. That's one thing, and you need to understand the requirements. Like the even providing mud, and uh, even putting like bark pieces and some old trees there inside the cage. Like even even putting a dead tree with a lot of bark pieces that helps. Otherwise, the uh, chicks even if they they lay eggs and the chicks are there, they will die inside the nest. So those are the problems. But the uh, some but other hornbill species. Uh, they breed. They breed in cages uh, in big enclosures. Uh, I have not heard about Indian grey hornbill successfully breeding in a zoo, but might be there will put be records. I, I I haven't read it about it. But do they? Uh, but uh, is there a need for uh, for say ex situ conservation of this particular species? No need. Apart no from need. being. Uh, being a good display species, maybe in a zoo uh, where one could actually see the uh, see the species, or uh, you know, if they could serve the purpose of conservation education. Um, but apart from that, uh, I was just wanting to know if there is anything uh, there is no specific need. in terms of. There is no need for Indian grey hornbill because it's not a threatened species, and uh, luckily it's not declining, so it's okay. Yeah, but other species of hornbills, they really need. If if uh, if it is done in zoos, that's a good thing. Right. Okay. And then the second question for you is, sir. Uh, during your talk, you you kind of outlined the broad biology of the species, which is quite complex in terms of their nesting, in terms of their feeding. So, 
I mean, if if at all a species like this has to be kept in captivity, you covered a bit of this in this previous question also. But what would you, uh, what what should zoos keep in mind in order to sort of create a near natural environment for the species when they are being kept in captivity? Nowadays, uh, big aviaries are uh, being built, so I think the aviaries is a good idea to have hornbills inside the aviaries rather than putting in uh, specialist enclosures for hornbills. So aviaries that you can you can directly put uh, fruiting trees if it is possible, uh, or at least they 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 are better off in aviaries. That's what I feel. So instead of having very very small enclosures, that 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 will help. I think you ah uh, I think you lost your connection, so we can't hear it anymore. Apendra sir, thank you for uh, giving uh, good information about your zoo. That's excellent. I visited long back, like ten years ago. Oh, uh, do you hear me? Now? Yes, yes, sir. I can hear you. Okay, one thing. I have the hornbills, these gray hornbills, they catch and they eat. And they say it is good for asthma. I tried to convince them that it is not the medicine of asthma, but they say like that. That asthma will go away if you eat the meat of this. Do you, have you heard about this thing? They call it kochila khai. Kochila means that it is the kendu uh, fruit. Okay. So they call okay. these uh, grey hornbills as kochila khai. Okay. <laughs> in Northern, in many other oh, yeah. places. Okay. Have you heard yeah. this? No, no, no. Because this awareness should be there that uh, no portion of any bird or animal should be eaten for the cure of any disease. Hmm. of human it right. should be there this awareness right sir. Uh, thank you sir and then the the, the last question to dr tapendra is uh, are there any specific initiatives taken up by marble palace for the conservation of uh, indian gray horn i i don't hear you now please repeat uh, uh, are there any specific uh, conservation measures taken up by uh, Mar Marvel Palace Zoo for the ex situ conservation of Indian grey hornbill? Yes, because next time we have already selected a portion of our garden, which is uh, there are uh, both people and the uh, banyan tree is there. We want to just enclose that man making one big aviary so that they can get the both the fruit trees inside that uh, enclosure. Uh, those were the questions for today, sir. Uh, so we come to the end of today's uh, talk, and uh, I would like to uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Raju and Dr. Kapindo, for for giving your valuable time for this talk. Uh, on behalf of members of the CZA and uh, other officials of Central Central Zoo. Thank you, thank you very much. But thank you thanks, all, all of you for the time and to see the day for we, this type this, of the series of talk will thanks, continue thanks. over the coming weeks as well. Uh, the next week is week uh, 69, and species in focus is uh, lesser adjutant star, and the zoo in focus will be uh, jungle mahal. So, uh, so you, it will be the same series of talk that will continue. Arvin Mishra can give it up. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thank you so much again. And uh, yeah. Okay.